Thank you, everybody, and um, welcome back from lunch. Welcome to those in the room and also the people joining us online. Um, if I could ask you to make sure that your phones are switched off or on silent, and to welcome you to this session, which is called Data, the Pitfalls, the Power, and the Story. It's being recorded, so if you are watching it online, um, the Q&A is underneath the, set, the live stream of the session, and if you're in the room, the Slido is at the QR code on the screen, and the recording will be available on our um, online platform, which is, the details are in your brochure. It'll be available in about 10 days' time. So I know you're here today to listen to these two amazing speakers, who I will introduce shortly, um, but I'm just going to take the first 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about, or well, I am in a minute, going to tell you a little bit about Hospice UK and the data programme that we are doing at Hospice UK at the moment. So my name is Anna Alcock. I'm the Director of Programmes at Hospice UK. Um, and over the last kind of year, we've been, I mean, we've always been doing this at Hospice UK, but over the last year, we've been trying to consolidate the kind of data that we're talking about, the collections that we make from hospices, and the reasons why we're doing it, and the kind of data we're trying to bring together, and the story that we're trying to tell with it. So the population data, I'm hoping that most of you know about our POPNAT tool, which is on our website. That's very specifically for you and for end-of-life care colleagues. It's national data, but it's brought together in a tool that allows you to use it in your geographical areas for the kind of populations that you're serving. The service activity data, I'm sure for many of you, has been a bit of a headache over the last couple of months, while we, I particularly have been chasing you for the activity and patient demographics from your services. And then the workforce data, um, don't be scared, but it's coming out in another survey in a couple of weeks' time. It was flashing through if you were in here just now. Um, so that clinical workforce survey is coming out to hospices after conference. The financial data most of you are involved in already. Um, there's a session that Craig was doing on the hospice accounts, and a lot of you now are part of the financial benchmarking, which is a quarterly um, collection of finance data. And then, and I won't say much about this because this is very much Fliss's area, um, the outcome data that you collect with your patients, and the PCOM 360 tool that we've developed with Fliss and social finance that also sits on our website. So really, I just wanted to list them. It's kind of boring, but I'm hoping that it kind of sets it in a framework so that when these surveys are coming out to you or when we're talking about another acronym tool that we've got on our website, it kind of all fits together in a story of what we're trying to bring together and why we're trying to share it back with you. And the reason for doing it all together is because over the last year, I think for pretty much the first time, we've been talking at Hospice UK directly with your data analysts, and we've brought them together in a network, like a community of practice for data analysts. And it's been really interesting talking directly to them as opposed to clinical leads and CEOs about some of the issues of doing some of our surveys, some of the issues that they have with systems, some of the ways that data is collected and um, extracted from the systems, and just sharing that knowledge and thinking about some of the barriers that we can tackle together. And there's no doubt that there is some amazing capability in your systems, and in other places, areas where we can learn from, and in other places, areas that still require some steps along that maturity journey. The bit about collating and comparing is what I was just saying. We spent quite a lot of time with your data analysts trying to get the definitions right for the activity survey. I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but we've started to sort of talk about the differences, the way you're, the language that you use and the way that your systems collate, da collect data and how we can bring that into a collation that is then comparable and can make sense across a wider geography, across the nations. And then obviously all the surveys that come out to you. And I suppose the reason why we're doing this is so that you can start telling the stories with a denominator and with other evidence in your back pockets. That's the way I kind of describe it. Like, you know your own stories and you have your own data, but to talk to your boards, to talk to your commissioners, even to go out in press stories, 
the idea that you can tell your story in comparison to not just your neighbours but others around the country and with that national denominator I think makes more sense and for us as Hospice UK obviously we then have the national picture to take to national governments and people and along the bottom I won't read them out but essentially all of this is trying to get us towards being able to answer some of the questions that I certainly get in my inbox from you quite a lot. You know, how do we put a price on our beds or how do we tell the NHS the opportunity cost of what we're providing? Is there a model, is there an optimal model that we should be doing? And also, what do we know about the people that we're serving and more importantly, the people that we're not serving? So the activity survey for better or worse went out in July and we're just about getting to the end of trying to chase up some of the data, cleanse some of the data and sort of look at what it's telling us. So I haven't got any total figures of activity to share with you. But I do have a couple of slides to, to tell you about, I think, the first one, a success story in terms of participation. So in blue across the nations is your response to the survey two years ago, um, the collection that we did from 2018 to 2021. That's the percentage of hospices in each of the nations that answered that survey. So 127 hospices. And this time round, 165 hospices replied. And for those of you in the room who are from Wales and Scotland, 100% response rate, which means that the data that you can now use in your conversations with national government, which are coming up quite soon for both of you, should be complete and up to date and about as good as we can get across your hospices. So an 81% response rate feels pretty good for the response, for the response to a national survey. We've started looking at the demographic data that you sent back to us, so I don't have the activity survey figures but some of the things that we were looking at in the demographic data was, again, the completeness of data. So one of the recommendations out of the Nuffield Trust report last time was that it was quite difficult to tell any story about demographic reach because the, the completeness of the data was very low. And as you can see, this time round, for example, ethnicity, which is what we picked out of the Nuffield report last time, over 80% of the, rec of the services that you reported on, the ethnicity is recorded for those patients. Again, feels higher than it has done in the past. And this bit, again, we're just starting to look at what you reported back in terms of who you're seeing, the primary diagnosis of who you're seeing. And I did write this slide before Professor Whitty was talking yesterday, but it does show you that in the non-cancer, it shows you the non-cancer to cancer um, patients that you're seeing, but also where some of that is breaking down into, for adults in pink, the respiratory dementia circulatory, now third in that, in that graph, and for children, the neurolo neurological conditions that you're seeing in the children's hospices. So this kind of percentage split, this kind of overall figures that we want to try and get back to you in a lot more detail in the coming weeks... And so what we're hoping to give back to you is obviously the totals for your nations and the regions of your, of your activity, of your contacts, um, to build on what we did in the Nuffield Trust about how much care is provided outside the hospice building. So that was a story, you know, from two years ago. That's, I mean, you all know this story, but having the figures to tell that story of um, there's more care in the community than in hospice. And you will have seen that this time round, we asked if you could try and define your services by specialist and generalist. I know that's a proxy and not always easy. But again, starting to sort of build the narrative for what we are providing with CNSs and consultants versus what we are providing with HCAs and carers and nurses. And so the way we collected the data should be able to give for us to give you the splits in those different ways to be able to have those different conversations with different funding people, potentially. Um, just to say that you all, and if you didn't, this one I will be chasing you for, um, gave your hospice catchment area. And so we're going to map that onto the POPNAT tool so that you can already search by ICB and small um, local authority area, but you should now, with this data, be able to just click on your own hospice and get your catchment area on POPNAT, which again gives you your local denominator for your population. 
And then really the demographic data, apart from the kind of things I've just shown you, that then only becomes, um, that really only becomes useful in your local conversations. So the demographic data then moves on to you comparing that with your PopMat data and deciding who you aren't seeing in your populations. And then, as I started, I will finish with plugging the workforce data. The clinical workforce survey is coming out after conference, so I'm sorry, but that is the next one that will enable us to bring all this data nationally and feed it back to you. So I just wanted to put a framework around the data that we're, the data program that we're doing at Hospice UK. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to the real speakers of this uh, session. I'm not sure they need much of an introduction because I'm imagining that you know both of them quite well, if not in person, then in publication. Dr. Ros Taylor is currently the medical director at Harlington Hospice in Northwest London. You'll remember her from Hospice UK. She's had 30 years experience in palliative care and was awarded an MBE for her services to hospice care in 2014. Next to her, Professor Fliss Murta, Professor of Palliative Care. She's a director at the Wolfson Palliative Care Research Centre at the University of Hull. Also works with Cicely Saunders Institute. And I forgot to get the exact title from you, but your new role at the NIHR Research Centre? is that Policy, Policy Research Unit. New role. I forgot to get the proper title. So... Um, Without further ado, um, I will hand over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette, for that introduction. Um, data isn't my comfort zone, and I expect some of you here, it's not your comfort zone either, especially immediately after lunch, but I hope to share not too many numbers with you, um, but particularly to look at the stories that data tells us, that some of you are collecting or some of you need to know, um, in order to influence. So you can see I'm pretty vintage, I've got my senior rail card up there like Max if he's in the audience, so I've been around for a long time and I've seen the focus on data and what we can learn increase in recent years, but not nearly good enough. So, and I'm also old enough to provoke, so hopefully I won't upset too many people in the room. So we need to use data to predict the future. We're very good at predicting the future of our patient's condition. We know what might happen, we don't always know what will happen. And we can use data in the same way as we learned from Professor Witte yesterday and from the amazing frailty geriatrician this morning. We can use data to plan our services, but do we? So that's data to stories. A few years ago, I was editor of a journal that sadly is now defunct called the European Journal of Palliative Care. And I wrote an editorial when I was still at Hospice UK about loving your data. And it was about the MDS. Some of you here will remember the minimum data set. And I was really disappointed when the minimum data set um, died. Um, because we no longer, for five or six years, there's been a huge gap in knowing what palliative care teams and hospices are doing and seeing. Um, and I'm really glad that Hospice UK, under um, Annette's leadership, is now taking that data um, story back, because it's so important that we know that what we're doing, we know the percentage of people we're seeing, and most importantly, we know what we're not doing. So, some of you here will also remember, no, you, none of you here will remember this article. <laughs> 1992 was the year that I started in palliative care. Um, I left general practice. And Colin Douglas was, um, well, he was a pretty disaffected Scottish GP, but he thought hospices were a complete waste of time. And he wrote an editorial in the BMJ. Um, you can see the title there. The hospice movement is too good to be true and too small to be useful. And that's been a quote that has been a constant challenge 
to me. Um, I'm quoting on the right from the article, in case you can't read it, but I've put the QR code if you want to read it. It's sort of both funny, provocative, and possibly still true. Why should a large and general need... You know, death and dying are not niche activities. It does happen to us all. Um, why should a large and general need be left to the scanty and scandalously choosy efforts of a patchwork of local charities? Well, that should make you all pretty cross. But it's that anger and challenge that should drive us to fill the gaps that we know are there. And he mentions later in the article, deluxe dying for the lucky few. And you need to question your own organizations. Are we still providing deluxe dying for the lucky few? So data, we can look at global data, always tells a story, national. Um, the, pink, the pink picture is Hillingdon, the borough I work in. I don't know why it keeps disappearing, there we are. Um, which is pretty affluent in the north of the borough and very, very deprived in the south of the borough. Um, and then, of course, you can look at your own organization. And perhaps we do spend too much time looking at our own organization rather than the population we are working in, which is now usually the integrated care system that we work in. So national data, what's the story? What can you, some of you will have, be very familiar with this map. This map tells us about access to opioid medication. And you can see the bloated North America and Canada um, Australia, the UK, but almost no access to opioids in South America and Asia. So that's the story. How are we going to address that? How, you know, I work in a place where we can get, sorry, access to any opioid within an hour, half an hour. Um, how different is that if you're working in South America or in Thailand? So the story, and the story is the lever for change. National stories, um, David Clark back in, Professor David Clark back in 2014, I think, did a really simple seminal study that showed 30% of people in hospital at any one time were likely to be in the last year of life. But we are still pretty rubbish at identifying that 30%. I'm going to um, give you a clue later about how you can do that. National data, I'm glad you're looking at workforce, um, Annette, because there's a massive gap in all aspects of our workforce, but that is a lever for change to look at different roles, and I think we've heard at the conference about different roles, and I'll mention another one in a minute. This was the last minimum data set, and one of the key findings in 2016 was that if you had a palliative nurse involved with your care at home, you were twice as likely, or more, I think, yes, reduced, reduced the number of hospital deaths from 50% to 12%. That's a massive reduction in the use of acute hospitals. Maybe it doesn't have to be a CNS. Maybe it could be a band four healthcare assistant or a paramedic or a volunteer even. So what we don't know from this story is who does it have to be who can address the issues to keep you at home? But perhaps more importantly for me, what we're not, it's what we're not doing, not what we are doing. The activity data that's being collected will tell us what we are doing. But Hospice UK, five or six years ago, pre-pandemic, told us that we are, there are at least 100,000 people, and probably many more now, who are not receiving any palliative care, generalist or specialist, towards the end of life. So if I was doing a poll, which I'm not today, I would ask you all to guess how many hospice beds there are in the UK. And... The fact is that number is going down. I think there were about 2,500 when I was working at Hospice UK, but there are nearer 2,000 now, which means that even if every hospice bed was full and everybody died in that bed rather than went home, then we could still only look after 7% of patients. And that's not a, a well-told story. So how ethical is it to ask people where they want to die 
if only 7% could ever die in a hospice bed? That's a question to ponder on. Do you know where people die in your area? I'm not going to ask anybody or pick on you. Do you know how many you reach and how many you don't reach? Um, because that, again, is the lever for change. And we've been doing some of that work in Hillingdon, where I work now. So collaboration has been a big theme of the conference. And I just want to share with you um, a couple of examples where we have collaborated, or my experience, we have collaborated between hospices to learn more. Many of you will be familiar with Jennifer Temmel's work from Boston, which is now, wow, 13 years old. Her seminal study showed that if we meet people earlier, at least six months before death, we improve quality of life, less depression, fewer admissions to hospital, and more people will die where they would prefer to die. So earlier intervention, that was the story from her data. It makes a difference. So when I was at Hospice UK, we did a study in collaboration with St. Gemma's Hospice in Leeds, led by Professor Mike Bennett, where 60 hospices shared their data, and we asked one simple question. When was, the oops, when was the first contact between any of your teams, community team or hospice, bed, when was the first contact between palliative care and death? And it was pretty shocking. It was nowhere near six months. And this was 2015, I think. So 60 hospices submitted de-identified data just looking at the gap between referral and death. And you could all do this now again in your patch. It's very simple, particularly if you've got an electronic record. The lead study showed, shockingly, that if you had cancer, you might be referred seven to eight weeks before death. If you were frail, old and didn't have cancer, it was usually less than four weeks, often one week. And that possibly fits with some of your experience, certainly it fits with mine. We get referred people into the hospice who have never had any contact with palliative care. They're 85, they've got heart failure and they're dying, breathless, upset, with lack of completion of goals that they would have liked to complete. So that was the lead study, and I really recommend that we do this again to see if we've improved, because we know that we should be seeing people at least six months before death to make a difference. So the audit that I'm going to spend a bit of time on now, have I got time? Yes, lots of time. Um, Northwest London, that's NWL, there are five hospices in our ICS. Um, there is St. Luke's, myself at Harlington Hospice, there's Meadow House Hospice, which is an NHS unit, there's St. John's Hospice in central London, and Trinity Hospice in south London does some work in the north. And we did a very simple thing. We just picked a date back in February where we looked at every hospice, looked at a lot of data from 20 consecutive admissions, all from the same day, so consecutive admissions, 20. We were going to do 40. So we've got a small cohort of 100 patients. It's a tiny number, and I'm aware that there may be statisticians in the room who say you can't tell anything from 100. But we, <clears throat> we did see a lot of trends that we think we, that were relevant for the whole patch. And I'm going to share some of those. So there were, it was mainly demographic data and clinical data but we also asked two qualitative questions. What would have kept the person at home? And what other setting could have cared for this patient? And we got some really, really interesting comments. So the point was not about learning from the data. The point really was to get hospices to trust each other in terms of sharing data. And it's been really successful from this point of view, we've met several times and we have many more projects that we're going to do together. And of course, by sharing data, because we're all small organizations, we are amplifying 
our reach in terms of data. So in terms of ethnicity, that was interesting. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stories, and we're going to delve into some of these um, findings. In terms of South Asian patients, there was a big disparity between gender. Um, we saw many more South Asian women, but very few South Asian men, whereas with white patients of a white background, it was 50-50. So we made an assumption. Is it more appropriate for Asian men to be cared for at home? I don't, oops, I don't know. Sorry, I'll keep stop banging that microphone. Um, but every data point asks a question. Um, and we can delve down into any of these questions now. Age, we've heard a lot about age and frailty. 38% um, of the 100 admissions were over the age of 80. And the commonest age band coming from hospital was really old, 80 to 89. And this was across a population of two and a half million people in northwest London. So what? Now, we've heard about paliatricians, the sharing of expertise of geriatricians, palliative care, doctors and GPs. And I do honestly think that that is the role for the future that we all need. Um, 70% of our palliative population is care for older people. And throughout my career, I've seen two distinct cohorts, particularly in inpatient services. It's young, complex oncology patients with multiple social problems, housing, future care of children, horrible symptoms, and it's the frail elderly comorbid population. And we need to recognize those differences and care in different ways, I think. So, um, one of my learnings from this morning from the frailty talk was we should be closing down all of our well-being and day hospice hubs and we should all be opening up frailty hubs. Something to take back with you um, tomorrow. We're all, well, actually we're not all going to live till 100. I, well, I hope not anyway. Well, maybe 90. But one in three of today's children being born today will live till 100. And that fits in with the demographic data I also learned that it's very locality-based, that if you live on the south coast, you're more likely to live to 100, um, or there's a huge need for geriatric care and frailty care, depending on whether you're living in a city where the population is younger. So to be able to know your demographics, and I think POPNAT will help you, but we also need POPNAT to go across ICBs now, not just look at our own catchment area. So living alone is also a trigger for earlier advanced care planning. 42% um, of our admissions across London, across Northwest London, lived alone in that cohort of patients. Um, most of our admissions are male, live alone, and old. And that's quite a change. But that is definitely a trigger. So living alone, so what? That's a trigger for an earlier conversation. Cancer, interesting, um, the first cohort of results from um, the data Annette shared showed 60% non-cancer, which is great, because when I started in palliative care, it was 95% cancer, and that's gradually been coming down. Um, in the cohort we looked at, it was 70, still 72% cancer, and yet we know that I think less than 30% of people die from cancer. So again, we, and we also know that the suffering from comorbidities is huge and not being addressed. We were a bit shocked by this. Uh, one of the questions that we asked was when was the patient last seen by a GP? All of the patients coming into the hospice had very complex illnesses with multiple problems and nearly 40% hadn't seen a GP for over a month. And of those who had seen a GP, nearly 80% were remote consultations. So, so when I'm saying, what's the story? Is there a disengagement from primary care towards those who are dying? And that's really sad. And I think this trend needs to be reversed. We also looked at time in hospital before 
people came to the hospice and some people were in there far too long and we analysed the notes of some of these patients as to why they were in hospital so long, in hospital for six weeks and coming to the hospice and dying in two days. And it was usually the lack of continuity of staff in hospital and the absence of relevant conversations. And I'm sure this is all familiar, but actually having the data to tell the story will bring about some change. So in northwest London, where I work, we have a much higher death in hospital rate. The top orange line is where people die in northwest London, and the blue line is national data. So we are trying to bring that orange line down um, by preventing admission to hospital when there are other appropriate ways to care for people. And in Hillingdon last year, there were 23,000 bed days for people with a palliative care coding. That's a lot of money spent in hospital. Some of it would have been necessary, but not all. And we know that if you have a palliative care coding, you are six times more likely to get admitted to hospital. So prevention of admission and how you measure that you've prevented admission, which is, a re you know, how can you measure something negative, is really important. But there are so many initiatives that can help. But this was a striking piece of um, data for us, that the general population, there's 103 admissions per, pop per thousand patients in the, last, in the last year of their life. Um, whereas if you've got a palliative care coding, and I'll talk about palliative care coding, 637 admissions. So one of the qualitative questions we asked was what would have kept people at home of those patients who did come into the hospice? 40% um, of the patients, the referrers said nothing would have kept people at home. The family were exhausted, the symptoms were too complex, um, and it was felt unsafe to stay at home. But for 60%, that's a high percentage, it was about more people, more connection at home, more GP reviews, more palliative reviews, perhaps more <coughs> volunteers, um, more night sits. That was a frequent request. Um, I work in a hospice that does have a night hospice. We provide, we don't have a day hospice really, but we provide, we can provide up to seven nights a week of night sits between nurses and HCAs, and that absolutely keeps people out of hospital and preserves the mental health of the carer. So keeping people at home, the other thing that was mentioned was training and coaching families into how to care and cope, improving the capacity of families to care at home. Um, and I've really enjoyed working over the last two years with a GP. We've developed a website called HPAL, which I'd love you all to look at, to give me feedback, um, what we're missing, what's good about the site, because you want to develop it and you could all become a contributor. There's a poster, poster 97. So the, sorry, this is just a plug uh, for HPAL. But you know, there's 8,760 hours in a year and even if you have four carers visits a day and go to the hospital, go to the clinic, go to day hospice or whatever, most family carers are still caring for over 8,400 hours a year. And how do we support those families? So HPAL, very briefly, it's got a portal for clinicians. It's all open access. And we've got very brief curated summaries of symptoms and of issues that we get phoned about from primary care and you can toggle at the top of the page to the carer and patient family portal which has information for family carers so you can see the um, some of the most recent articles um, information about itching the middle one is how to move somebody in and out of bed now I'm a doctor I am clueless about moving and handling I've been trained about 10 times but I'm hopeless and many we assume that many family carers just know how to do these things um, 
So having expert resources available to help people understand how to move somebody in bed or how to change a sheet when somebody's in bed is really valuable, I think. So have a look at HPAL. Um, those are the benefits. I won't go into them. You'll get the slides. Um, so the key points from our collaborative audit that I learned, just 100 patients, small cohort, we're looking after very old people, we need to work closer with our geriatric colleagues or our colleagues in elderly care medicine. Living alone is a huge risk factor of needing institutional care. Our GPs disengaged from caring for the dying and people are spending too long in hospital. I think I knew all of that, but having the data will allow us to perhaps put in bids for a different sort of service and it will allow us to plan for the future. So we can collaborate, we need to collaborate with all of your neighboring organizations to amplify stories. So I'm just coming to the end for the last few minutes. The other data we need to look at, we've heard care homes mentioned this morning. In the patch where I work, over 23% of deaths are in care homes. Are care homes the hospices of the future? I think they are. So what are the questions we, or you, need to ask you need to know which of your care homes are having the highest number of admissions to hospital. And then focus your education on those care homes. That's my idea. And all of this data is available at borough level, at ICS level, and um, at national level. And you can drill down, certainly where I work, to individual care homes and look at the admissions per bed per year to hospital. GPs, again, who dies in hospital in your patch and are there particular general practices that are sending in a lot of patients towards the end of life or having a huge number of bed days? Is this, again, where we should focus education? And deprivation. Some of you were probably at the um, session on poverty today we know that that's a huge risk factor in terms of a bad end-of-life experience. And you can geographically look at the deprivation index of where your patients are coming from. Certainly, all of our patients, most of our patients, come from the most deprived areas of our catchment area. And I remember seeing this at a lecture on deprivation. Um, I work in London nine stops on one of the tube lines, the central lines, there's a massive um, change in life expectation. Um, nine stops on the underground between Bond Street, where you can live till 95, if you're rich enough to live in Bond Street, to White City near Hammersmith, nine stops and 12 years difference in life expectancy. And we need to know who is living in our catchment area. Um, I'm lucky enough to work in northwest London where we have something called the WISIC database and dashboard where we can drill down to individual patients and monitor how many days they spend in hospital, where they die, what their illnesses are, when they last saw their GP. Um, it started in Hillingdon, but it now is spread across northwest London. <coughs> and people have developed in northwest London an algorithm to which leads to a palliative care code. And I said earlier on, how do you know this 1% who, how do we know who are the 1% who are gonna die in the next year, where we need to focus our um, services or our provision? The palliative care coding is made up of an algorithm um, based on frailty, on age, on diagnosis, and uh, recent hospital admissions. And it's picked out 3,500 people who we need to somehow interact with early advanced care planning, light touch support throughout their illness. And I think we can make a difference. So at the moment, we only see 1,000 people. We are only seeing 30% of those who could benefit from earlier palliative care. We need to um, step up and transform this is my second to last slide, I think. 
So at the moment, if you look at that funnel, we're seeing people far too near the end of life, and we're only seeing 1,000 of that 3,500. We are just setting up PICS, our Palliative Integrated Coordination Service in Hillingdon, so with a plan to see 3,000 patients over the next two years, which sounds scary, but it's possible. And then when we've identified them, and a bit like we heard in the frailty um, lecture this morning, we will find a light touch way of supporting people using volunteers, using the principles of compassionate um, cities, to support people along the way and then put in the right services at the right time. I haven't got time to talk about Ross, the Lancet Commission, final, but if you Ross, have, is this that your my final time? Slide hmm? Is this your final slide? One more. <laughs> this is, yes, just to mention the Lancet Commission if you really want to have a vision of the future. So medicine is a science of uncertainty, but data gives us a bit more certainty um, and we really need better data and you all need to engage with your local data and just a final story this is deluxe dying for um this is noi who's in bed and we had a pony visiting and this really is deluxe dying and we can't have ponies visiting all our dying patients but we could have more people having their goals met she really wanted to see a pony there we are thank you Okay, so hello everyone. Oh, you need that. I need this. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's lovely to see uh, people that I know and lots of new faces. Just to introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm Fliss, and I'm a professor of palliative care, and I lead this group, uh, which is the Wolfson Palliative Care Research Centre, and it's in Hull. So, just in case you weren't sure where Hull was, we've had Hull featured quite a lot today. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about individual level data and outcomes. Uh, nobody who knows me will be surprised, but I've got some challenges for you. I've got some challenges around consistency, cooperation, coordination, and courage, okay? So if you are feeling tired after lunch and you want a snooze, just take away the courage, okay? That's the bit you, t you need to remember. But I think it fits very well with the talks we've had already from Annette and from Roz, because we actually need to be very consistent now in what we start to report, we need to cooperate, great example, Roz, and coordinate together. And we also need the courage to look at the data because we have for a long time assumed everything we do is fantastic because we have people telling us that uh, because they are experiencing less than ideal care in other settings. We can't rest on our laurels. We need to examine critically what's going on. And we can't do that without the data. So I've got a clear plan for you to take away, uh, practical things. Now, please forgive me if you're already on number four of these, but I know that we have a diverse audience, and some of you will be at one, some of you may be further down, uh, some of you will be with the pitfalls. But it's based on thinking about your population, thinking about the people that you see, the path that they take through your service, and the power of data, the power to show the impact of what you're doing. And I think that's a place that we really need to show people outside of palliative care the real value of what we do, and I'll give you some examples of how to do that. But I will also, along the way, mention the pitfalls. And for those of you who would like some uh, interest in a data session, I've got the four horsemen of the apoc apocalypse. No, it's not quite right. I've got four horses, so let's look out for the horses who are coming partway through the talk. So first of all, population. We heard from Annette about Popnat, which is a wonderful resource, and I hope you all use it. 
But I think we need to really think critically about the population that we're serving. And I would refer you to a couple of other useful resources. The GeoPortal, which is being developed very rapidly to make data uh, publicly available on a geographic basis. And also Shape Atlas. If you've not signed up, uh, I would urge that you tell your analyst to sign up to Shape Atlas. You just need an NHS email and you get up-to-date uh, geographically informed uh, data. And it's very useful because it does a lot of the boundary work for you. Uh, also fingertips, of course, um, and we've already heard about PopNAT. So as a very minimum, to understand your population, you need to know the age of that population. It's helpful probably to have breakdown by 10-year categories because if you just report summary statistics, it hides the breakdown by, by decades. You need to know, of course, uh, the men and the women. You need to think about ethnicity by area and remembering that most of the minority ethnic communities that we work with will be historically younger. Uh, thinking about deprivation by area, and there's lots of excellent statistics on that. Housing status is really important. And by housing status, I mean the kind of properties people live in. Is it their own property? Is it rented? Is it multiple occupancy? And although that's not a perfect proxy for uh, deprivation status, it's a good one. And living alone, as Ros has already mentioned. The challenge in this data is intersectionality. So how is the cake cut by not just age, but also ethnicity? Not just uh, gender, but also housing status. And that's the tricky bit. And I think people are pushing towards more nuanced intersectional data for geographical areas. But we haven't really got that cracked completely yet. So knowing your population is one thing. You then have to link that up to the people seen by your service. And we've already heard about the people we don't see. And if you look at point one and point two together, you can understand the extent to which you are reaching the sections of your population that you probably may not have done previously or need to reach better. This is an example from Dove House, Hull, featuring again. Um, but it's the people seen that you would have to think about for each of your services. And the sort of data you need, again, age, the standard reporting, but also by 10-year uh, categories, proportion by male, female, the proportion of ethnicity data. I have to say that's a challenge because often the, the quality of the data on ethnicity is very poor. Self-reported is the ideal, but it's often not, not accurately collected. Uh, deprivation deciles, so we've heard that deprivation is important. If you have the postcodes of the people who you have seen in your service, you can use a lookup facility to get the deprivation decile from 1 to 10. And that is really helpful because you can then look, you can section to see, are you seeing a, de a deprivation profile that you would expect for your area or are you missing some of those in the more deprived area? Housing status, ask people the question. Living alone. Diagnosis, and the other challenge here is multiple conditions which none of us record very well. So do think hard, how can we accurately capture multiple conditions? And then Rockwood Frailty Score, or at least the Electronic Frailty Index as a minimum. So know the population and know the people that you see and then think how they relate to each other. And this is where the discussion about equity in access comes in. And you can, with those two sets of data, make some intelligent interpretations even if you can't necessarily unpick exactly how intersection intersectionality works in your area. So for example, you might have a younger population with more diverse ethnic, ethnic backgrounds than you'd expected, or, or vice versa. You might have an older population which is very uniform. You just need to get to know your area and then 
how does that reflect in the people that you see? So, it's also really important to go beyond that and not just think in the population demographic terms and the people demographic terms, but to think about how you can compare uh, in a clinically meaningful and comparable way. How can you describe the people you see? So I would say here comes in the three core assessment and outcome measures, and you'll be familiar with these, I think, already. Palliative phase of illness, the Australia Modified Konoski Performance Scale, and the Integrated Palliative Care Outcome Scale. And these are being very widely adopted now across hospice and palliative care teams, and they allow you to describe your population in a clinically meaningful way. Um, so let me show you here an example. This is three services. The bars are, the different coloured bars are three different services. So one service blue, one service green, one service orange. And you can see the distribution of the uh, Konofsky performance scale, which is actually pretty close across the three services. You might notice that the blue service has got slightly more people with greater mobility and that perhaps the green service has got quite a few people with lower mobility. So you might hypothesize that actually they're slightly older in the green service, and actually that's the case. You can also look at the IPOS scores, and I know people often say to me, oh, how reliable is IPOS? We're not sure if it's reliable enough. But this would refute that, because this is data again from three different services, showing the prevalence of each of the items as reported through IPOS. And what's remarkable to me is how consistent it is. The pattern is exactly the same across both the physical problems on the left and the more psychological problems and practical communication problems on the right. You will see that the blue bars are a bit higher, but remember they were perhaps a different age distribution, so that would explain the, the minor differences. So you can describe your population not only in terms of demographics, but in terms of what is happening to those people as they arrive at your door. You can go further if you're well down that road, and you can start to report case mix classes. This is data that's just about to be published, and this is the community case mix classes. Now, what case mix is, it's about levels of complexity. And I think this is a bit of a holy grail because we've often wanted to describe the people we see in terms of different levels of complexity. So this is a way to combine those three measures and get six different classes of complexity and cost weights. The cost of their palliative care per day is weighted. So group one is based at one, one unit of cost. And then the, the most expensive one, the, the sixth category, which is the most complex, is 2.8 times that cost. And that is really useful, but it's quite an advanced use of these measures. Um, and we have a long way to go with that as yet. But it is very helpful for predicting what's going to happen because you measure these things at the start of episode and you can predict the expected cost of care for that person. So, third requirement is to think about the path of people through the service. And we've heard a bit about this from the study by Allsop and, and the others at Leeds. So this is about thinking episode start and episode end. How long are the episodes of care? Do they compare with other hospices in your patch, in your area? What are the episode results? Do you have the same proportion of people who die at the end of episode? Do you have a lot of people having repeat episodes of care because you have a model to discharge them and to take them back on? Or do you keep them all on where they have longer episodes of care? And understanding that, comparing that, reporting that in a group of hospices will really help you understand what your model of care is like and how it's responding to your population. There is a challenge about community episodes of care because you need to actually close them when people go into hospital or inpatient hospice care. 
<coughs> and the reason for that is that you would not expect to resource care in two settings at the same time. And there's also a challenge in terms of equity of access. We heard that actually we need to be seeing people six months before the end of their lives. Some models of care may be taking people very late and others may be taking them earlier. So understanding the length of episodes and comparing them is important. You can use the data from this very, in a very nuanced way. So on the left, there is a box plot showing the community length of stay, median about 40 days, which is very much in keeping with the work that Ros was quoting earlier. We know that time in community palliative care has been steadily reducing um, over the last years. But you can also see how people flow in terms of phase of illness. So if we take unstable, red, you can see that actually people admitted in the unstable phase sometimes go to the stable phase and things get resolved and settled, but sometimes they move to deteriorating and then dying. And understanding these kind of flows really helps you understand the clinical patterns in the population that you're seeing. Fourthly, and I think some services are already at this point, but some are working towards it, know the impact, the, the power of your care, what it's really doing and really delivering for all of the patients that you see. So this is a two summary figures which show you about the changes in IPOS scores uh, over the episode of care. So on the left-hand side, you have got data about the people who change. They either get worse or they get better. So the green bars show the proportion who get better. The brown bars show the proportion who get worse. You won't be surprised to know this is an inpatient hospice unit, and quite a lot of people are getting worse, and so their symptoms are increasing. But nevertheless, you still see in this deteriorating illness context, you still see a lot of improvement, so about 15, 20% improvement in many of these patients, which is a real achievement because it, the episodes of care are quite short. They're about 12, 14 days at the most. But you also, for completeness, see on the right the people who have no change in IPOS scores. Now, they might have no change because the symptom is completely absent, in the green column, but they might actually have no change because they've got a severe or an overwhelming symptom which does not improve. So that's the red one to alert you that there may be a problem there in terms of the optimal care for people. Okay, so here's a breakdown of that red column to give you more detail. So for each of the items, you can see Green means they don't have the symptom, zero, zero, over two time points. The pale green shows it's mild and it doesn't change, it's still mild over the episode. The yellow shows moderate symptom that does not change. The, the orange shows a severe symptom that doesn't change and then the red shows an overwhelming symptom. So you can very quickly look at the red and orange bars to understand where people have got persistent symptoms which are not improving and where we just need to think critically, what could we do differently? Is there something happening that we could expedite? Um, it might be a symptom we don't think we can improve very much, fatigue, but it might be pain or it might be breathlessness. It may be that there's uh, a nurse-led model of care, but there's a slower access to prescribing, for example. And so can we speed up that process and try and reduce the proportion who are getting persistent symptoms, especially when they are severe or overwhelming? So it gives you a very, very detailed tool to tell you how to improve care for your cohort of patients. And you can look also at things like this. This is looking at all people with moderate, severe or overwhelming levels of a symptom to see what proportion improve over the episode of care. Uh, quite high, actually. 
you know, 30, 40% of people improve. So you can see very positive impact, but you can also see where symptoms are more stuck. You know, fatigue, we've always traditionally said we can't do very much about it. Those who are looking at rehab, palliative rehab, are showing us to be wrong about that. So, you can look at this in lots of different ways, and we, uh, certainly with the sites we work with, we try and provide useful infographics which show uh, the proportion with improvement in different symptoms, the proportion with major improvement where a symptom is completely reduced to absent or mild, or we can tell the story of an individual symptom, perhaps alongside some case studies. This is about breathlessness. So, here are the four horses. <laughs> and I wanted us to remember this image because in my experience, this quadrant of how to use outcomes data um, is neglected. So most hospices or community palliative teams or hospital palliative teams for that matter, tend to focus on one of these quadrants. And actually, if we're gonna be smart, we should focus on all four of them. So we can use outcomes data with individual patients to prompt a dialogue about where the issues of concern are and to focus on the things they're concerned about. We can use with patients at a group level to screen. Where do I need to do a full assessment for depression, for example, or any other screening item that you might want to pick up? Where do we use these away from patients? Well, we can use them in the team in multidisciplinary team discussions and decisions, and then we can use them for business intelligence, annual reports, service development, and service improvement. Most teams that I work with major on one area, whereas actually we need to get the maximum out of this because it's hard work to measure individual level outcomes. So we've done a lot of work to develop training uh, we've just recently put up a training video on IPOS use in the dying phase, which people have been asking for. We also have a prototype outcomes registry, which I would like to take to the national level, so watch this space. There's also a lot of support from Hospice UK in this space, and they have been running some wonderful ECHO webinars, uh, both for clinical practice in this area, but also for the data people in this area. Uh, I would really encourage you, if you go to the ECHO networks, it's number two and number three, do join up and share the learning. So, it's a time for action. Are you capturing the individual level outcomes data? Those three measures, we now know from a re the recent uh, survey that about 75% of hospices adult hospices in the UK are using these measures, and most are using all three. And do you, as leads, communicate the importance of data and outcomes to the team? Seek out the, the data on the population, the people, the path, and the impact. Ask those questions. Do you have outcomes champions at every level of your organisation? Do you have data analyst capacity to extract and report on this data? And do you include regular training on the use of the measures, uh, particularly in induction, but ongoing training for staff to revisit? And can we all cooperate and coordinate to be very consistent in how we report this? And then it will be of the most value to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for, well, I find them very inspiring conversations, but then I've suddenly turned into a data nerd over the last year. Um, please do put any questions you'd like to ask either of our speakers onto the Q&A or onto the um, Slido. Um, I'm going to start with the first one that came through because actually I think it's for me. Um, so while the rest of you gather intelligent questions for the others, I will answer this question. Not, I'm, saying, not, I'm saying it's not intelligent. I'm saying I'm not an intelligent answer to it. Um, Popnat, 
I'm not sure... I'm going to answer the question in both ways because I'm not quite sure what the question is. But the answer to are children's hospices going to have their catchment areas mapped onto PopNAT, the answer is yes. We collected the catchment area from children's and adults, so yes, the catchment area will go onto PopNAT just the same. If your question was, uh, are we going to put more population level data that is more relevant to children's services on PopNAT, then the answer is also yes but it's a little bit further down, so uh, down the pipeline. So we are going to do the catchment areas, and there is a plan to put more um, children's data on there, but actually we're mostly waiting. I'm pointing at you, I'm not waiting for you. I was going to ask you if you know when Lorna Fraser's data might come about, you mean that's what we're really waiting for, the prevalence data. Yeah. Do, do you mean the... She's, I'm not sure which data you so mean. So she is doing um, an update of the children's services prevalence data. She's yeah, done it in yeah, Wales, and yeah. the plan was to do it in England I don't know. as well. I don't know when it's ready. So um, we were waiting for some of Lorna Fraser's more up-to-date data so that we could put that on. So I hope, whichever way round your question was answered, that that's answered it. Um, I have a question from the audience for either of you really, but I'm going to direct it to you, Ros, in the first instance. Um, it says, we've talked about care homes quite a lot at this conference, but actually more people are cared for with domiciliary or lived-in care, and how should hospices better support this part of the workforce? Um, that's a really important question. Uh, the question we don't know, are we, of all the people we're assuming that dying at home is a good thing, it's often a preference, I don't think we know the quality of dying at home. Uh, Fliss might update me, but I don't know the evidence that it's always good, but we do know that many care home endings are not going well, and that's my personal experience of um, where I've worked. I think in terms of support, I think we've got to be really creative. We haven't got enough CNSs to visit more care homes or to visit more people at home. But I think, again, it's about, I strongly believe we should be coaching families. I think training and supporting domiciliary care agencies in the same way as we're looking at programs to support care homes are absolutely crucial. Um, and many of the people going in for the four visits a day, going into dying patients without any help in learning how to communicate, how to recognize distress, um, when symptoms need to be escalated. I think we're putting s those staff in a very difficult position. So I would like to see much more robust training and coaching of domiciliary carers and agencies who are all private agencies who probably don't invest enough in training. So we should use our charitable money for more training and education, but also using volunteers in different ways to support. It won't work in all communities, but certainly in village and rural communities, training up cohorts of volunteers to visit dying people or lonely people. I think that's, we've seen some great examples in the posters here. I think it is about working alongside rather than having lots more band six and seven CNSs, dare I say. Thank you. Um, Fliss, there's a question about how can we take a holistic approach to outcome measurement that accounts for non-clinical needs, e.g. socioeconomic, and the costs of responding to these? So there are some things that you want to measure at individual patient level, and there are some things which you need to consider at a cohort level. So one wouldn't expect, one would hope, that regardless of one's socioeconomic status, that anybody in care would achieve the same outcomes. So they would still have their pain managed as well, their breathlessness, their information needs, and so on. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to measure socioeconomic status using an outcome measure. I would want to ask the question, are all the people that cross the levels of socioeconomic classes achieving the same outcomes. Uh, we've actually done that piece of work recently with uh, one of the sites that we work with, and it showed that if you could get into the service, you could achieve the same level of outcomes regardless of what end of the 
the, the socioeconomic spectrum you might be. And that's really encouraging because we don't want to have differences like that. The difficult part is getting into care because if you're in an area of greater deprivation, um, you are less likely to have the resources and education and advocacy to get into a service in the first place. So that's the big question. Does that answer the question? Um, I, I would say with outcome measures, we can't measure everything. They're long enough already. And if we tried to measure everything, we would make them too long and they would not be workable. They are a trade-off between length and information. Um, and many people tell me that the iPods is too long. So I wouldn't want to lengthen it. Thank you. Um, there's another question for you about whether any work has been done to consider how the oak measures can help us understand who should be accessing an IPU bed for best outcomes? Yeah, that's a good question. We have not yet got to the stage of consistently ap applying the different levels of complexity, let alone deciding which of those levels might need inpatient care. And the other thing I would also say, it's not just patient need which determines inpatient care, it's their situation. So you might find somebody in, for example, quite, quite impractical housing, a house of multiple occupancy or temporary accommodation who needs admission because they don't have a place at home that is safe and suitable. So inpatient admission decisions don't rest only on directly on patient and family need. They rest on the services available to support them as well. Thank you. I'll give you a break. One just one moment while I think I answer this question. Is the data work of Hospice UK being shared with our NHS PELC networks, that's England and specifically, um, to avoid duplication as they seem to be looking at and funding data projects that relate to data sets and reporting? Um, the answer to that is yes, they will be. Um, we've spoken to the NHS networks in England about the freedom of information request data that we got back from your ICBs, um, and we will also be speaking to them with some of the news stories, I guess, from the data work that we are doing with you. Um, the briefings will go as briefings nationally and to your networks, but I think and I know the person who asked this question. In your area specifically, I did speak directly to your um, network lead because actually you haven't developed your dashboard yet. So we did have a conversation about whether we could actually have some standardized definitions to allow hospices to collect data one time and answer more than one dashboard. That won't happen across the country because in other places the dashboards are already in place and locally you tend to talk a lot about referrals whereas we've talked quite a lot about contacts and outcomes. Um, so yes and no, it won't necessarily be the same data collection but we are definitely sharing data and if any of your networks do want to talk to me about the definitions we use or aligning our dashboards then please do, please do give them my name and my contact details. Um, a final question, I think, um, for Fliss. Are you able to elaborate on the forthcoming research on cost of care, in particular in terms of dependency, and when this is likely to be published? Uh, I presume you mean the case mix uh, complexity slide. Um, that is, the proofs have gone back, so I hope it will be published within the next couple of weeks. Same. We will put it, uh, a link to it, on our Resolve training page. So if you look on that page, I will put the link there so that you can then access the published report. Uh, a warning, it's very long. It's about 200 pages, but there's lots in there that you'll find really interesting. Um, I've just been thinking again about that question about domiciliary care agencies, who are a huge workforce, uh, caring for, poor, for people towards the end of life. I think one top tip would be to make sure that every agency working to support people at home in your area knows the number of your advice line. Um, we are going to use HPAL, the website that I mentioned, to um, embed it in care homes and with domiciliary care agencies so that they've got an advice line number to ring and also a website to look at to learn a bit more about palliative care because they often do not have the capacity to come to 
training courses, but to be able to pick up a phone to ring an inpatient unit or a coordination, palliative coordination hub to get some advice and to encourage that relationship. I do remember when my sister-in-law died, at her funeral, there was a team of carers who'd been looking after her for four or five months who had never been spoken to by the palliative care team or the district nursing team who were also looking after her. They were really isolated and excluded, but had done most of the important care. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say, because there is a question on here about minimum data sets. Um, that national minimum data set run by NHS England is unlikely to be run in England at that level again. But I don't want to end on a really bad note by mentioning the fact that if you're in England and you have an NHS contract, then you are supposed to be filling out what they are calling the minimum data set, which is the CSDS collection. But I don't want to end on that note, so I will end on the fact that that's why Hospice UK is trying to do these data collections, so that we are creating our own data sets um, for us as a community to share with commissioners, our boards, and whoever else we want to share our data with. So I'd like to think that we're replacing that slightly, um, but there are still contractual you know, things that you have to do nationally for your NHS contracts. Um, it's now time to go to the exhibitor hour and poster viewing back where you normally have um, your refreshments. That starts now and then um, there are refreshments that follow. But mostly I would like to ask you to give a massive round of applause to Dr. Taylor and Fliss Mertuk for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.